Good morning, Ramp Church, and good morning to all of you who are tuning in for maybe the first time. Welcome to our online service. We're so glad that you've tuned in. We've been praying for you and believe that God is going to minister to you right where you're at. So Ramp Church, let's just join together in making music to the Lord, fixing our eyes, focusing our hearts on His goodness, calibrating everything about us to His love for us, and let's fill the atmosphere of our home with our praise to Him. For your mercy never fails me And all my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Till I lay my head Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God Sing all my life in all my life you have been faithful In all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am made Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God Sing, I love your voice your voice you have led me through the fire in the darkest nights you are close like no other i've known you as a father i've known you as a friend and i have lived in the goodness Goodness of God. Sing all my 
I just want to read to you Psalm 116. As Olivia was singing that out, I just heard this verse, Psalm 116, verse 1 and 2. I love the Lord because He hears my voice and my prayer for mercy. Because He bends down to listen, I will pray as long as I have breath. You know, prayer is a powerful way of communicating with the God who loves us. It's asking, it's listening, it's receiving from Him, it's telling Him what's on our heart, and it's calling upon the name of Jesus so that we can be saved in our time of need. And I want to encourage you, Ramp Church, and those of you watching, maybe some of you want to just put in the comment section, what can we call upon the name of the Lord with you about? You know, there's a powerful verse in many uh, in Psalm 107, and over and over in this particular Psalms, it repeats this line. It says, Lord, help. They cried in their trouble, and he rescued them from their distress. Lord, help. They cried in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. And it just repeats that throughout the Psalm. I'm telling you that no matter where you're at with God, if you call on the name of Jesus, and you ask for his help, if we can join with you in praying for what you need, I know that God hears. Yes. And the power is not in the fact that we pray. The power is in the fact that God is bending down to listen, that he is responding to the name of Jesus on the lips of his children. So let's just join together all across wherever we're watching, and let's just take a minute longer just to ask the Lord for his help. All of us need his help. We need your help, Lord Jesus. We call upon the name of Jesus. It's in that name that we find help. It's that name that's a strong tower. It's that name that brings healing. It's that name that brings peace. It's the name of Jesus that brings resurrection life. Jesus, our hope is in you. Jesus, you're our source of joy, our source of unending strength. And we call upon you and we thank you, Lord, that you bend down and you hear us and you're responsive to us, that you are responsive to the cries of your people, that you are responsive to our needs. You're responsive, Lord, even to our desires. We give it all to you, Lord. I love how it says in 1 Peter, It says, cast your care on the Lord because he cares for you. And some of you are really weighed down with some heavy burdens. And I feel like this morning, just you as an act of faith, typing that burden out, typing that need out is just a practical way to just kind of show in the natural realm that you're casting that care onto the Lord, that you're removing it from your own shoulders. It's too heavy for you. You can't carry that. The presence of God is meant to relieve heavy burdens. We have burdens of uncertainty and questions and doubts and sin weighs us down and struggles weighs us down and we cast that onto Jesus. He, he can bear that burden for us. So Father, we cast our burdens, but Lord, not just our burdens, we, we give our whole lives to you, Lord. We give you the burdens, yes, but Jesus, with our fresh yes, we want to follow you. We give our whole lives to you, Jesus. We give our whole lives to you, Lord. We give you lordship over every area. The parts that we're proud of, the parts that we're not so proud of, the parts that we have got perfectly figured out, and the parts that, Lord, we don't have a clue what's going on. We relinquish control and we hand it over to you right now. We relinquish control and we hand it to you, Jesus, and we rest in your lordship. We rest in your sovereignty. We rest in your goodness, Lord. And I pray, Father, for all of those who are watching and tuning in. I pray, Father, that their eyes are opened and their ears are opened to see the goodness and the glory of God in Christ Jesus. Ramp Church, let's just agree. Stretch your hands, Ramp Church, and let's just all come into this point of agreement. And we agree for Jesus to be revealed to all of us. All of us need increased revelation of the goodness of God. Lord, we want to know you more. We want to know how much you love us even more. Lord, we want to know the sacrifice that you paid, Lord. We want to know what it cost you to have us even deeper, Lord. We pray for just a release this morning 
of revelation of your love for us and your goodness towards us. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, it feels sometimes in the natural, you think, well, I'm just praying to air. Or I'm just typing to a computer. But God's presence is here. And his eyes, he sees everything. I love the author of Hebrews says, everything is exposed before God. And he sees it all. And he hears it all. Even the faint little cry in your mind that didn't even get out of your lips. He hears. He knows. And he is responsive to those who humble themselves before him. So I want to encourage you this morning, expect God to answer when you, when you call upon him with all your heart, when you seek him with all your heart. Well, Ramp Church, it's great to be on this continued pursuit of God with you. Each in our own homes, we are still after this one thing, this one thing we ask of the Lord. This is what we seek, to gaze on the beauty of God to just behold His glory and His presence, to know Him more. So Ramp Church, this morning we're about to take up our tithes and our offerings. And I just want to read a promise to you because we've been so touched by your faithful giving. Thank you, Ramp Church, especially those of you who have been blessed in this season and how you have increased giving to compensate for those who are under extreme financial stress. I want to just acknowledge, if it means a lot to me, I know that God sees and is moved by your sacrifice, and it's pleasing to Him. So, Ramp Church, I want to read to you a promise that God gives us in Malachi 3, starting in verse 10. And this is the Lord speaking, and He says, Bring all the tithes, which that means just bring the part that belongs to God. All of it belongs to God, but this is what we give God to remind ourselves that it all belongs to Him. We bring the tithes into the storehouse, and God says, so there will be enough food in my temple. Now listen to this ramp, church. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have room to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. Your crops will be abundant, for I will guard them from insects and disease. Your grapes will not fall from the vine before they are ripe, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Hallelujah. God is so good to provide and bless his children. And even in times of need where we have less in the material world, we have overwhelming glorious resources in Christ. He pours out blessing of His Spirit, peace, joy unspeakable. You are rich in God this morning. And let's pray and believe for every financial need to be met. Lord, we thank You for Your promise. We thank You for Your provision. You are our good Father in Heaven. And Lord, we bring our tithes and our offerings. It all belongs to You, but we bring this to You, Lord, to remind ourselves it belongs to you and to give an act of worship, an act of sacrifice that cost us something, Lord, that shouts your worth to us, to every facet of our lives. We give it to you, Holy Spirit. We ask that you would use it to bring good news of the glory of God. In Jesus' name, amen. So on your screens, you'll see the giving details, Ramp Church. Thank you for your giving, and we are missing you and praying for you every day. And once again, welcome those of you who are watching for the first time. Just comment in that section. Why don't you guys just shout out not just your prayer needs and what you're believing God for, but let people know where you're living. If you're in Manchester watching, we're coming from South Manchester this morning, but we welcome you from wherever you're at, and we pray you're blessed by this service. Hey guys, so glad you've joined us today. Let's get straight into the word. I want to read you one of my favorite verses and it's going to really set up this message. So it's in Matthew chapter number 11. Let's look at it together. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Now, doesn't that feel amazing? This is Jesus saying this. We could just stop right there and I'll go home and just meditate on that. Take my yoke upon you, Jesus says, and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is 
light. Let's pray before we kind of unpack this verse a bit. Father, thank you for everyone joined together now, and I thank you that your presence is with us wherever we are, whatever home we're at, whatever situation we find ourselves in today. I thank you that you are enough to meet every need. I I pray that your word would be accurate today, that it would be alive in our hearts, and uh, that it would be meaningful to each one of us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, uh, when, when I think about rest and the need for rest, I think about some of the most tired moments I've been in my life. And I don't know if I've been more tired than when I'm jet lagging. Can I get a witness from anybody that's done international travel? Uh, I actually have a funny story. When we first moved to the UK, our whole family, so it was it, before we moved, it was days of packing, the whole moving thing. It's not just international travel, it's packing. So we came over with Lots of boxes taped up, and we unload. And, and shortly after we move uh, is my first day in the office here in the UK. And um, instead of my normal kind of rhythm, I was pretty heavy in jet lag after moving. And I get a call uh, an hour after I'm supposed to be in the office, and it wakes me up. So my first day in the office... Uh, I get a phone call saying, hey, just wondering where you are. And I'm like, uh, be there in a sec. Be there in a minute. Why? Because jet lag is exhausting. It's tiring. So that was a great first impression, guys. So uh, let's probably not want to reproduce that moment. But one thing I've noticed about being in quarantine is that I feel like I should be more rested than I am. It's like my world has stopped. Uh, as far as going out and about and, and, and meeting people here and there. And I I'm, I'm, have more family time because there's, there's no traveling involved or commuting. And it seems like I should be more rested, but I haven't actually felt more rested. And I think you can relate because I've seen some of the things that you posted online, some of the memes, and about some of your responses to, to this quarantine. And there's a couple that made me laugh, so I wanted to laugh together. Should, look, look at this first one. This is hilarious. This is for those of you that that your life feels like quarantine all the time when you find out your normal daily lifestyle is called quarantine. Uh, Here's looking at at, at you, some of the introverts in Ramp Church who are watching right now. You're like, wait a second, this is my everyday life right now. But this other one, uh, some of you just gave up on 2020 altogether. And this is what you wrote, 2020 will be our, 2021 will be our year. (laughs) This, This year is... Uh, worthless is basically what you've decided, and 2021 is the new year. But, it, 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 you know, all joking aside, I think that many of us live in our normal life outside of quarantine with almost like this underlying, like, low-level tiredness, this low-level exhaustion. It's like we just, we bounce from, like, uh, espresso to espresso, latte to latte. We, we bounce from, like, uh, short night of sleep to short night of sleep, weekend to weekend. And there's almost this tiredness that just lives in our lives. And I, I think for me, that's readily apparent in this season because when my world has stopped, I thought, I thought surely I, I would be able to catch up on sleep. Surely I'd have a bit more energy than this. And this is what I've realized about quarantine is that tiredness isn't new to this season. We've just finally stopped to notice. We just finally stop to notice the tiredness that we're already carrying. Uh, it's, it's like in the modern world, we just live in this constant state of tired. Can anybody relate to that? So here's the question that I thought I wanted to answer to, to get us kicked off here in, in the message. Why? Why are we so tired? Why are we so tired even outside of quarantine? And I think there's, there's some things that, um, that are going to be really insightful for us as we dive into this topic. And then we're going to dive into back, we're going to go back to that verse. We're going to visit Jesus's invitation to come to him and rest. And I think he has some really neat things for us to learn today. But uh, there are three things. There's, There's a million things that make us tired in this season. But there are three things that I think in the modern world especially make us more tired than ever. And the first one is this, uh, technology. Technology. We are more distracted than we've ever been in the history of the world. There's a recent study done that that found out the average smartphone user touches their phone over 2,600 times a day, a day. 
Their finger touches the screen of their phone over 2,600 times a day. Is that shocking to anybody? And that, that adds up to a total time of, of almost three hours. Now, we add that to in the UK, the average time that, that an adult watches television is over three hours. So the television's on for over three hours a day that I'm watching, and my smartphone, I'm, I'm touching my smartphone over 2,600 times a day. Now, some studies said that millennials, um, the younger generations, I'm included in that, that we touch our phones as much as 5,500 times a day. So shocking technology, technology is sped our world up. Do you know that the average person in the UK right now sleeps about six and a half hours a night? The average adult sleeps six and a half hours a night. Now, before the light bulb was invented, the average person slept for 11 hours, 11 hours. So technology, what happened? Technology, artificial light made day longer and it changed everything about the way we live. So technology has sped up the world. Um, but it's not just changed the way we, we act, it's actually changed the way we work on the inside. Time Magazine recently did a study where they, they showed that our attention spans are actually shrinking. And do you realize that now, this is in the Time Magazine study, that we have humans have a shorter attention span on average than a goldfish that a goldfish is outpacing us in how long it can focus on one thing. Why is that? Because we live in a world of distraction and you can't tell me that's not affecting the way we're tired. Uh, when you think of someone who's relaxed and chill, you think of someone who's present in the moment. Well, if we live in a distraction age, technology certainly is not helping in that. But it's not just technology, it's also job and career. And this is such a, a, a crazy time to be alive. I think, you know, job, uh, having a stable job is almost a thing of the past, isn't it? I mean, if you think back to my grandparents' generation, often this, the job they started when they were 18 years old is the same job they had when they retired. And the, the, the stability of the job market was just a totally different thing. And now we're even in a season where quarantine even uh, exaggerates this. Some of you are, are in a place right now where, where your, your entire livelihood's been, been lost because of what's happened in this. It, it just job and career just adds stress. It also adds hurry to our life. Where there was a time in, our, in, the, in the history, uh, in history where the disparity between rich and poor, I know we feel like it's, it, it used to maybe be bigger than it is now, but that's actually not the case. Historians tell us that in the, uh, historically, the disparity between rich and poor was maybe about 10 or 20 times. Well, now in the modern age, it's about 100 or 200 times. The, the, the rich are that, have that much more wealth than the poor in our world. And that's created an interesting situation where the, the, the low earners among us often have to have multiple jobs just, just to pay the bills. So job and career, it's, making our, it's speeding our lives up. But the high earners among us, whereas those jobs used to be really secure, and maybe we thought of high earners having all this free time. Well, now it's exactly the opposite. If, if you're a high earner, then you're expected basically that your life is your job. Your life is your career. And if you're not interested in working 70, 80, 90, 100 hours a week, then that's fine. There's a line of people behind you that are willing to do that. And so all of us are in this job and career situation where it, it runs our life, but that's not the only thing. So technology, job and career, it's an interesting day to be alive. Here's another one, it's, it's drive, it's drive. So there are external reasons that, that put us in this place of, of hurry, 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 push, 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 uh, which leads to tired, 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 but it's not just external things. There's actually internal reasons. There's an internal drive that we have that we're not just distracted and overworked, we actually need the validation of achievement. There's something about achieving more that, that fills an emptiness on the inside, that it's not just an exterior thing, but it's an, it's an interior, it's an internal demand. There's an internal torment of keeping up with those around me. It's, 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 it's interesting to look at what has happened in our economy over the past 100 years. Our economy really used to be driven by needs. Um, people, they, they only wanted what they needed, really. Our, our jobs were built around just getting our, our basic needs. But if you look at the economic shift, and you can find this in the marketing uh, that surrounds us constantly, is it's all driven by wants. 
And now we're constantly driven by things. Our needs, are, uh, most of our needs, especially in the West, are, are met. But most of the things that our heart is longing for are not in the needs category. They're in the wants category. They're in the desires category. And that is this drive to always have more. Always have more than I have. And the, the, the problem with more is it's never satisfied, is it? It's just an internal drive that however successful I am, I'm not successful enough. However much money I have, I don't have enough. However much stuff I have, I don't have enough. How, however high profile my friends are, I just don't have enough. Whatever that is, there's just an internal drive. It's trying to fill something on the inside. And I think that's why we're seeing increased rates of depression, increased rates of heart disease, increased rates of divorce in modern times, increased rates of suicide. Um, we're, we're, these things are running rampant mental health issues are a problem. I think it's not a stretch to see the connection between the things we've talked about are that are causing deep, really tiredness in our lives, this exhaustion, and all these results. And you can't really address these issues without looking at the source of these issues. And it, and it, and it makes Jesus' invitation to rest even more beautiful. But Jesus wasn't the only one that pointed to this This. This issue, and there, there's a couple writers um, that I wanted to, to to show you what they had to say about this. So here's Corey Ten Boom, who was a Holocaust survivor, but she was also a writer. I, I love this. She said, "If the devil can't make you sin, he'll make you busy." And it's such a it's 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 such a wild idea, but it's so true because sin and busyness really have the same consequences. They have the same results, which is disconnection from God, disconnection from what matters most, and it puts me focused on things that don't really matter. And so Corey Ten Boom saying those things are really in the same category. But look at, look at Carl Jung, who's, of course, the, 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 the famous um, psychologist. Look what he says. Hurry is not of the devil. Hurry is the devil. Now, this is a secular thinker saying this. Hurry is not of the devil. Hurry is the devil. There's something about that life of hurry that disconnects us from what we were really made to do, what, what, what we were really made to be connected to, and that's the life God has for us. Look at Pastor John Mark Comer. Hurry and love are incompatible. Like you, those two things can't live together. If you look at somebody who lives a rich life in love, you found somebody that's probably at a pretty set, steady and slow pace because love takes presence in the moment. And so he, he takes that, so far as to say hurry and love are even incompatible. And if those weren't enough, look, look what Father Walter Adams, who's, who's C.S. Lewis's spiritual director, look what he had to say. To walk with Jesus is to walk with a slow, unhurried pace. Have you ever heard that phrase, how's your walk with God? Or how's your walk? I just love that we use the word walk because you, you generally don't walk because you're trying to get anywhere in a hurry, right? So to walk with Jesus is to walk with a slow, unhurried pace. Hurry is the death of prayer and only impedes and spoils our work. It never advances it. And you, you could look at, well, what is, what is Father Walter trying to say there? You could look at what he's trying to say is, you never, what you gain by hurry doesn't outweigh what you lose. That's ultimately what he's saying. It never advances it. Hurry can never advance love. And to me, Jesus is, um, Jesus' invitation is where we're really going to go the rest of this message. But I want to unpack a couple verses for you that unpack this principle right here. And that is this. Your life has a pattern. Your life has a pattern. It's not just... If you looked at the past few weeks, maybe besides just the quarantine weeks, but you even in quarantine, you've probably already formed a pattern. But if you looked previous to, the, to, to quarantine, your life was probably pretty, pretty you know, ex, you kind of expected what was going to come each week. It was, it was pretty much the same. There's a pattern that you live by. You, you, you probably learned that pattern from your parents or your workmates or maybe it was something left over from university. Whatever it is, you live by a certain, you live by a certain pattern. And the biblical writers interacted with this concept. And I want to show you what Paul said in Romans. Look at this in Romans chapter 12, verse number 2. He says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test 
and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And I love the way the New Living Translation translates this same verse. Look at this. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you'll learn to know God's will for you. You'll, you'll get to know his pattern for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. It's, it's wild to think that Jesus' life is, is a teaching to us, not just the things he said. And that's ultimately what the biblical writer here is trying to say. You can learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. And we can, we can see God's will for the way we live as humans in the life of Jesus. And if we weren't meant to learn something from Jesus' life, then he should have just been born and then died and then, awesome, we can celebrate those events. But there's a whole lot in between birth and death. I know in the Christian calendar we just celebrate Christmas and Easter when he was born and when he died. But there was a lot of years in between those two things and we can learn something from the way he lived. And we can actually learn a pattern that he lived. And there's a, we're actually starting a new series today and the series is called Peace. And a few of the things I'm gonna be uh, talking about in this series are about this pattern. But for now, I wanna get to Jesus's, back to Jesus's invitation in Matthew chapter 11, we're gonna unpack this. Matthew 11, verses 28 through 30, "'Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, "'and I will give you rest. "'Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, "'for I'm gentle and humble in heart, "'and you'll find rest for your souls, "'for my yoke is easy and my burden is light.'" I'm gonna pull four phrases out of this verse, out of Jesus's invitation, and that's gonna kind of frame um, frame the rest of this talk. And it's going to kind of show what, what exactly is Jesus inviting us into. And the first thing that he's inviting us into is that first phrase, come to me. And I want to tell you today, for all of us, for you, you and me both, there's an invitation to come to Jesus. And wherever you're at, it doesn't matter your history, it doesn't matter your past. You know, as a church leader, I've heard so many different reasons why people have, t have decided inside of themselves why, why Jesus wouldn't accept them. And they, they've, told me things, they've told me things like, Joe, you wouldn't believe the things I've done. And if you knew, if you knew the things I have done, you would know that God would never accept me. And my answer to that, maybe you're in that situation, uh, my answer to that is he's, he's already invited you. He's already invited you. He, he invited you before, before you did those things, and he knew you would do those things. His invitation stands, come to me, come to me. And it's amazing the ones he calls to him. He doesn't say, come to me, those that have it all together, those that have all the right answers, those that are really religious. He says, come to me if you're weary, if you're heavy burdened. Those are the ones I want. I want to tell you, you can come to him Today, his capacity is unlimited. And, and what does it take to come to him? John chapter number six tells us, Jesus told them, this is the only work God wants from you. So maybe you're in the place where you're going, well, I, I just haven't done enough for God to accept me. Uh, maybe some of you are in the place where you're going, no, you, you, I don't really need God because I'm fine on my own. I want to tell you, what you're doing there is you're bringing your own work into the equation. Where you're going, what I've done is enough to satisfy my soul. I want to tell you, God says there's only one work that's needed. This is the only thing he wants from you is to believe in the one he sent. Of course, that's Jesus. That your belief in Jesus is the only requirement to come to him. You hear the invitation to come and then you respond and you come. And, and no matter what your situation is, he's going to accept you today. We're in a little text group. My, my, um, my wife, Stacy, her parents, and then my youngest daughter are all in a text group. She had a birthday recently and so Stacy's parents started this text group to, to wish her a happy birthday and then there's been a, cu a couple chats back. Well a few days ago Chloe just randomly, I just woke up one morning and uh, opened my phone and saw that she had sent this text the day before. L look at this text right here, this is hilarious. She, she sends to the whole group, hello everyone, I like how I am the only kid here in this group. She loved the fact that everybody else was adults 
and she was the only kid. Now, she's one of three daughters, so if you, if you have multiple siblings, you know this feeling. I want to tell you today, this, this so made me laugh, of course, but the other thing it made me realize is, wow, we all have a desire to be seen, to be noticed, to be felt, really to, to be, to be uh, interacted with in an individual fashion. And I want to tell you, wherever you're at today, God knows where you are. He wants to interact with you in your individuality. He wants to come. He can speak your language. He's not like, he's not overwhelmed. His, his prayer inbox is not like 100,000 waiting on his responses. He has unlimited capacity. And if you want to come to him today, he, he can single you out. He can give you his undivided attention today. And you can come to him from that place. I love it. Um, Jesus tells us in Luke 15 that when you make that decision to come, that that, that decision is, is so celebrated in heaven that actually the beings that surround God right now are actually celebrate when you make the decision to come near to him. So the first part of Jesus' invitation is to come to me. The second part of Jesus' invitation from Matthew chapter 11 is take my yoke, take my yoke. And um, he's not talking about egg yolks. Wrong spelling, guys. Uh, this is a different word. And obviously, Jesus is speaking to an agrarian society. So um, egg yolks is not what he's talking about. What is he talking about? He's talking about the, the wooden structure that, that two animals, that you put on the back of two animals as they're plowing a field. And um, when they're plowing a field, you have both animals that are working together. They're connected for, for, the, for the sake of pushing this weight forward. And Jesus is saying, I actually have a yoke that you can be connected to. And some of you right now, you feel the weight of the world around you. You feel the weight of all the things I said earlier. You feel the weight of technology, of job and career, of the inner drive. And so that's why I want to ask, what are, what are you yoked to today? What, what are you yoked to? What does it look like to be yoked to Jesus? That's ultimately the invitation. And this is what it looks like. John tells us, um, John records this in, in chapter 15. Uh, uh, Jesus says this, I'm the vine. Jesus is saying he's the vine and we are the branches. If we remain in Jesus and he remains in us, we will bear much fruit. Apart from him, we can do nothing. What does it mean to be yoked to Jesus? We abide with him. We are with him. Really, That what's the invitation? Once you come to him, you just live with him. You just be with him. The invitation starts with coming, but then it moves into abiding. So we go back to this question right here. Who are you yoked to? Who or what are you yoked to? Are you yoked to a certain pace? Are you yoked to hurry? Are you yoked to urgency? Uh, are, you, are you yoked to the demands of others? Are you, are you yoked to, to people pleasing? Are you yoked to success? Are you yoked to, to zeros on your, on your bank account? Are you yoked to promotion at work? What, what are you currently yoked to? I can tell you this, whatever you're yoked to, if it's not Jesus, it's causing more pressure and weight on your life than he does. Maybe we're tired not just because we haven't come to Jesus, but because of what we're yoked to. Maybe we're yoked to the wrong thing. This is such a popular story, but I think, it, I think it really paints this picture well for us in John chapter 10, where Jesus is interacting with some of his friends. And now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who sat at Jesus' feet, the Lord's feet, and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Anybody feel that way? Uh, do you not care that these people have left me to, to, to carry this yoke all by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you're anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. And Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. I don't want your life to be consumed with things that aren't necessary. I want you to be consumed with the one thing that is necessary today. And it's, it's the yoke that Jesus is offering. He's inviting you to. And the, the beautiful thing about that is he's paid for this. He's paid for this with his own life. And, and, and again, just takes belief. But this is a principle I want you to know as, as we're studying this. Don't try to pay for what's already a gift. 
Don't try to pay for in your life what's already been gifted to you. I've seen so many posts uh, during quarantine about seizing this moment. Do everything you can to seize this moment. And if, if you don't start a new business or, or if, if, if you're not making more money out of this quarantine, then, then you're not really doing quarantine right. And at some point I'm like, hold, hold on, let's put the brakes on a bit. Don't we think that that is actually that internal drive that's just taking a new shape in this season? And do we really think that's what's going to fulfill us? And it's kind of this opportunistic sort of a thing. But I want to tell you, when you've been offered a gift, don't try to turn the gift into an opportunity. Because an opportunity is based on your efforts, but a gift is based on the efforts of someone else. An opportunity is based on what you're able to see, what you're able to see is your own abilities. But when you're offered a gift, it's based on what somebody else can see in you. It's based on the purpose somebody else has for you, and it's based on the price somebody else paid. And I want to tell you, Jesus has eyes towards you today, and he wants to give you a gift in this season. And maybe it's not the gift of a new business that you're seizing in this moment. Maybe it's the gift of a lighter burden, a lighter yoke. Maybe it's the gift of his presence. So I want you to come to Jesus. I also want you to take his weight on your back because it's light and it's easy. And then the next thing we can learn from Jesus' invitation, I want you to learn from him. I want you to learn from Jesus. Because this goes back to what we were saying before. Learning from Jesus is about a new pattern of life. It's not just about believing the right things, but it's also learning a new way to live. That you're currently following a pattern But is it the right pattern? And so I want to ask you this question right here. What pattern are you following? What pattern are you following? Maybe maybe that needs to be evaluated. Are you following the pattern that leads to life? Are you following a pattern that leads to lightness and to joy? Are you following a pattern that, that is leading to health relationally, health mentally? Or maybe... Maybe you're believing the right things, but your pattern is keeping you stuck in a place of tiredness and exhaustion. And look, look, I love this verse in Matthew chapter 5. This is at the beginning of Jesus' greatest message that we have recorded, and we call it the Sermon on the Mount normally. Jesus uh, is, is saying uh, um, all, uh, he's basically initiating his brand new kingdom. But at the end of chapter 4, the, the Bible says in Matthew chapter 4 that Jesus healed all of them. He healed all, that, that people brought sick people from the surrounding regions and, and it says Jesus healed them all. And I love this, how Matthew, the writer of this says, and now Jesus opened his mouth and began to teach them. I think I, th- this phrase right here always stuck out to me. Jesus opened his mouth. I mean, he's teaching them. Of course he would open his mouth. I think what Matthew's trying to say is, no, he's been teaching you. Now he's just using words. So if you see the way he interacted with with sick people, the way he interacted with injustice, the way he interacted with lack, he was already teaching you. He was teaching you a way to live. But you're only listening when he opens his mouth. If we can view what Jesus is doing, everything that he does, as a lesson to be learned, it's going to transform our pattern and the pattern is going to transform your destination. It's going to transform everything about your life. Now, before he healed everybody, Jesus actually spent 40 days in the wilderness. And you can go, man, that that had to be awful. I don't think it was. He was alone. He was spending time with God, recharging. And straight out of the wilderness, he comes into a time where he is he's healing everybody that they bring to him. And then he finally decides, well, I guess I'll open my mouth and explain what I'm doing. He's wanting to teach you, not just with words, but with his lifestyle. Let's follow him. Come to him. We can take his yoke and then we can learn from him. And this is what I want to tell you about maybe where you're at. Maybe maybe where you're at is not just a desire problem. Maybe it's a pattern problem. And sometimes, especially when you think about church, you're like, oh my gosh, they're just going to tell me that what I want is a bad thing, that where I'm at in life is a bad thing. And they're just going to focus on all of those, all of that. And they're going to tell me my beliefs are wrong. And, and I just want to tell you sometimes as God is, is, is rewriting the script on the inside of us, as he's renewing our mind, as he's transforming us from the inside out like we read earlier, sometimes the thing that actually keeps that from happening is not just that, not just that we're studying the wrong things, but it's that our pattern is wrong. There's something about our life that's keeping God out. There's a hurriedness. There's an exhaustion. There's a constant m- forward movement. There's, there's a drive on the inside that's pushing him away. And look at this verse. 
I love this. Jesus was teaching them as one having authority and not as their scribes. Look at this principle that that's trying to tell us right here. Jesus' pattern is worth following because he has authority. Why can we trust in his pattern? Well, because he's not just a regular old teacher. He's your designer. He designed you. He knows the way you're built. And there's a difference between the fact that you're responsible and you're a steward over your life and you knowing how you're wired. Uh, not, not too long ago, Stacy and, uh, and I sold our car. So it was an old car and it was a little too small for our family. So we decided to sell it. Now, what you, realized, what you realize when you start to sell a car is all those things you didn't care about when you owned a car, like getting the, the car dealership to stamp the, the maintenance book every time they do a service, you all of a sudden start to care about. Because every seller is going to ask, what is the maintenance records for this? Have you kept, you're like, oh yeah, I've done all the maintenance, I've changed the oil and all that. And they're like, okay, can you show me the maintenance stamps? You're like, yes. Yes, that's, yeah, no, I can't actually. They're not in there. But I did it, I did it, I did it. What, why do they care about that? Because although I, I had the ability, it was my car, I could have treated it any way I wanted. The only way that car is gonna last and perform at its utmost is if I treat it the way its designer created it to be treated. The way its creator knows this is how it needs to be treated. So I wasn't just given the car, I was given a maintenance manual as well. And I want to tell you, I, you can do whatever you want to with your life. But the only way you're going to be at the, opt, at the optimum of performance and flourishing and thriving and health is if not you just refer to your own desires to guide you along this path, but you refer to what is, who's the authority on the way I'm designed? Who's the authority? Who has the pattern for the way my maintenance is meant to be structured in my life? Jesus' pattern is worth following because he has authority. So we know he's calling us to him. We know he's asking us to take his yoke. And we also know that he is inviting us to learn from him. But fourth, and this is where I'm going to land um, this message, he, he wants us to find soul rest. So all, all that stuff is not just an exercise in being more religious or, or you know, getting on well with, with church people or, or saying Christian things. It's really, this is where it all ends. It's not just about a pattern. And that's, that's what I want to tell you here. Look at this principle. Finding soul rest. Look at this principle here. The pattern isn't about a pattern. It's about a person. The pattern is about Jesus. That the invitation is not, hey, let's live a great patterned life. And if you're wondering, what are all these patterns about? Well, I'm going to unpack that in, uh, in future messages. I want you to tune in next week because I'm going to unpack the next stage of what this pattern looks like for us as a community, as a church family, what it looks like for you to really put you in the place of thriving. But where I really want to end this message is to get you to, to, to start this journey, not by adopting a pattern, but by changing your relationship with this man right here, the man Jesus. Because all the patterns that we put into place, they're all just about Jesus. The pattern isn't about a pattern. It's about a person. The pattern is about Jesus. I just want to read a few more verses. I know we've read a lot of scripture. I just want to read a few more verses, and then I'm going to end uh, by, by just giving you some encouragement on, on what the next step's for you, and then I'll, then I'll pray for you. But let, let's look at these verses. Um, Genesis chapter 2, verse 2, and this is God at the end of his work, and this shows God resting. On the seventh day, God, let's say that word together, finished, finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work. Isn't it wild that God rested? I mean, I'm pretty sure he wasn't tired. You know, you know, it's not like, whoo, those planets, they were tough. They were exhausting to create. Let me figure out how I can catch a quick nap, guys, before I interact with Adam and Eve. No, it's not that. The, his rest didn't come from the fact that he was exhausted. His rest came from his satisfaction that the work had been done. And I want to tell you, why is there this drive underneath all of this? Well, look at this. If we go one chapter later in Genesis chapter 3, this is the result of man choosing his own way. And this is, this is what God says about the way that you've chosen. God looks at Adam and Eve and goes, hey, you've chosen your own way. Let me describe what that's going to look like from you here on out. To the man, he said, since you listened to your wife and ate from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat, the ground is cursed. You're, what, what did the ground represent for Adam? It's his work. It's the place he worked. 
all of your life you will struggle to, to scratch a living from it. It will grow thorns and thistles for you, though you will eat of its grains. He's saying maybe it'll supply your needs, but there will be an, in, there will be an inward desire that it will never touch. You'll never be able to say it is finished. You'll never be able to find the satisfaction that God found when he rested. But, I, but that's not the end of the story. Because when God said these words, when he described to Adam and Eve what, what their decision was going to result in, he knew all along, I have a remedy for this. I have a solution for this. And we find thousands of years later, we find Jesus coming to earth to pay the price for our decision to bring us back to the place where we could find satisfaction again. And we know that that happened through him sacrificing his life, him giving his life on the cross. And we see him, we see the picture of him on the cross where he's, he's, he's writhing in pain. And you can almost see that as the physical picture of what happens on the inside. When we have that drive on the inside, he was paying the price. He was paying the price of fruitless labor, of laboring in a field but not being satisfied, of working and not really finding rest, of that constant hurry that we're in, of never finding another way out. And then when he gets done paying the price on the cross, look what he says. John chapter 19, verse 30, and Jesus said, it is finished. And what was he saying there? He was saying his work, of course, was done. His work of redeeming you and I, his work of paying the price that we couldn't pay to, 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 to get us what we, what we couldn't earn any, any other way. He was, he was saying that his work was done, but he was also saying, you and I, we can rest because it's done. We can be satisfied because everything we need to find that in, to meet that inward longing is met in Jesus. And this is the idea I want to end this message with. True rest is found when you can say it is finished. Everything you need to reconnect with God, he's given to you everything you need. He's, he's the shepherd. The Bible calls him the lover of your soul. And let me read a few verses that I want to leave with you as we close this message. The Lord is your shepherd. He says over you, you, you don't need to want anymore. Why? Because the things you want aren't met by physical physical objects, that deep divine longing on the inside, he's meeting it. He makes you lie down. I'm glad he said he makes me because sometimes I don't want to. Sometimes that inner drive keeps me awake, right? I, I love working. I, sometimes I want to work too much, but he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. That's what he wants for you today, soul restoration. Look at Psalm 62, verse 1. My soul rests quietly only when it looks to God. From him comes my deliverance. And I want to pray over you as we close. And I just want you to receive anything that the, the Holy Spirit wants to give you right now. Father, I thank you that you're, you're giving an invitation to come to Jesus, to take what he has for us, to learn from him. Father, and and and... And, and then find rest. And I just pray for deep soul rest for every person who's watching, that the inner drive is silenced in the beauty, the satisfaction, and the nearness of Jesus in their life. And I thank you, Father, that this call and this invitation is to every single person. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for watching. We'd love to hear from you, and I hope to see you again soon. No.
Don't.